Verse 1 is like an invitation to worship. Invitation to worship. The psalmist in Psalm 122 verse 1 says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Sometimes we wonder, how glad are we? How motivated are we? Uh, we, we think about uh, uh, situations in our lives. We think about uh, weariness and sickness. But when it comes to here, let, let, let's go up to the house of the Lord. Let's go to church this morning. Let's go. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's an invitation. You see, I will go uh, to the house of God to worship with God's people. Now that's uh, very little today, even among Christendom, that really have uh, seen that as important. Think about that for a minute. You see, I will go to the house of the Lord, I will worship with God's people. Here in, in verse 1, it's mentioned two places, in the assembly of the upright, and that speaks of at home and family worship. But then it says, in the congregation, and that speaks of the corporate worship. You see, corporate worship is built upon private devotions. Private devotions. Often when I speak to people that, that have a, an aversion to come out to church, okay, they, don't, they don't see the need or the privilege of coming together not in this building, but coming together with God's people, coming together with, in, the, in the power and direction of the Holy Spirit to worship God, they don't see any importance. And they, they're always talking about private devotions. I said, well, I'm not talking about, forget about your private devotions. I'm not talking about eliminate your family worship. I'm just saying private and family, you come together corporately in the congregation. That's what the psalm is. Corporate worship is built upon one's private devotions, one's private worship. Do you have private worship? You don't have to have a guitar like me sometimes, you know, that's, that's, uh, it's always been a blessing to me. You see, I used to be, a, just, you know, I still do, actually, you know, just go off and, you know, like rainy days and Mondays and mo definitely just play all the time, sing unto the Lord and, and write new psalms and new things like that. And that's just me, that's like David in a way. I have that, that, that gift, that privilege. But do you have private worship? What about family worship? But here we're talking about corporate worship. worship. So what is worship? Well, that I have a series of messages on that, right? I do. It's, it's an interesting set of uh, messages. What is worship? Well, here the psalmist starts off with praise. <clears throat> praise. I, I think that's a good place to start. I will praise the Lord. And that includes singing. <laughs> That includes thanksgiving, giving of praise, uh, giving of offerings. It includes preaching. It includes fellowship. You see, dear ones, listen. There's no such thing as secular with a believer. You know what I mean by that? Joseph, when you're flipping those burgers, or you're digging a ditch, whatever may your job may be, it's, it's, it's always worship. Do you understand that? Guys, when you're at school, college, all that exam before me, uh, yeah, you know, is that, that worship? You see, there's nothing secular. Everything is holy. Because that's who we are as believers. Well, I just come to church to worship. No, no. You're worshiping 24-7. The Spirit of God, you are the temple of the Spirit of God. You're a habitation of God through the Spirit. And so, uh, you know, the scriptures, I think 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, give us some things to do, like, like reading of scripture, and praising, and prayer, admonishment, uh, lifting the other one us, uh, each other up, in, in uh, edification like that. But you see, the psalmist begins with worship. He begins with praise. Now, there's two things that, that marks a spiritual church. Two things. First of all, a singing church. A church that loves to sing. The other part is a church, church that likes to fellowship one with another. 
Now, this is, includes preaching and teaching and fellowship and giving. But the whole idea, give me a singing church who engages in worship and give me a church that loves to hang out. <laughs> They're worship. It's because of worship. And so worship is very important. I mean, singing, music. Uh, you know, we, we talk about uh, you know, uh, what Abby was doing and Franz Jr., uh, others that have... Uh, you know, play music and song, song leading, all that. It sets the mood, it sets the atmosphere. A singing saint, a singing church. Boy, what a blessing. You see here, we're talking about worship for a minute here. He says, I'm going to worship God with my whole heart, verse 1. With my whole heart. You see, the idea is, bless the Lord, O my soul, with, and all that's within me. Praise His holy name. Everything that's within me. I want to come this morning and praise and worship Him with my whole heart. The idea is a heart that is aflame with sincere affections. Yeah, that's called emotions. <laughs> okay. Uh, full of the Holy Ghost. Now we must be careful of what's called strange fire. Right? It's not all emotionalism. And it, there wasn't, it can't be just dead orthodoxy either. Okay? We hear a little sermon, we hear the Word of God, our preaching, and it's dead orthodoxy. We might be right on the money in our doctrine, but there's no flame, there's no fire. You see, sound doctrine should produce sound practice. And dear ones, if we have done anything, if we, have, if, if we realize, uh, let me put it this way, um, if we have worshipped this, this morning, then we have met with the Lord Jesus. We've met with God the Father. We've We've come into, uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. But it says, with our whole heart. You see, that's the seat of, of the heart. It says, all the issues of life come from the heart. You see, I want to worship God with light. I want to worship God with heat. They go both hand to hand. Okay? But you see, there's the mind. And yes, we should worship Him with the mind. We should worship Him with the emotions, the will. Singing, praising, preaching, teaching, every, every part, giving, every part of it is worship. Wholeheartedness. Now, the opposite of, is that is a half-hearted, a divided heart. You see, we're, you know, like, uh, you know, the old saying, you know, yeah, yeah, I'm in church, I'm sitting in that chair, but my mind, my heart is somewhere else. Where is your mind this morning? You know, it's, you know, people, a lot of it's on the golf field, you know, playing golf, or sports, or music, or, you know, or uh, TV, you know, it can be all different things, right? But you see, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, I think it's uh, 7, one of those verses that Pastor Tim always reminded me of, he says, I want to serve and worship the Lord without distraction. It's hard sometimes, but little ones, Sarah? Joseph, I understand that. But you see, there's grace given. Okay? In, in, the, in the battle of trying, well, I'm going to worship God with my whole heart. I'm going to give Him my best, my morning, my best offerings. My whole heart. I don't want to give Him leftovers. I want to give Him the best. And so the psalmist says, Praise ye the Lord, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright, and in the congregation. I will praise Him. When no one else will. Now, I, you know, it says, I will praise the Lord. You know, sometimes you, you, know, you, you, you read devotionals, and you say, well, I don't feel like praising, so you just kind of work it up, pump it up. I've been there in Pentecostals, and, you know, they pumped it up so much, it became, that's all it was. Just wildfire. But there's sometimes we realize as Christians, I just don't feel like it. My body aches. I'm distracted. I'm concerned. I worry. I have issues. At 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm awake. I'm sitting there, what am I doing to wait? I'm praying, but I'm also trying to worship. I'm just not trying to think of all the things and what do I do here? And what do I do here, Lord? What do I do here? How do I handle this? What I should do here? What about this? What about that? I, I, I just, I, I still have to worship. 
with my whole heart. Praise Him. When no one else will. Well, that, that would be at home, on the job. I don't want to get too fanatical here. You see, why don't we praise Him? Why don't we praise Him? I think of any, anything that should be an earmark of, of Christians is praise, thanksgiving, joyfulness. Even in the midst of the fire, right? And I mean, we have our, you know, we say, well, we're not in much fire. <laughs> you know, we, we talk about churches in, in India and other places, you know, being persecuted and adapted. Uh, but we, we have our trials. We're not trying to minimize those or say they're, oh, we're just, we're just uh, you know, uh, soft. We have our trials, we have our areas of our lives that, are, that, are, that need grace, you see, but we need to praise Him. Uh, maybe we don't praise Him because we're too busy murmuring, too busy complaining. You see, if we're silent, if we're ignorant of who God is, that's why the psalmist goes on to say about works, His works. What would be the greatest motivation this morning to help you to praise and worship God. <clears throat> think about yourself, think about how good you have it, or think of, you know, count your blessings, name them one by one. Hey, I, I like that. But if you, we would just turn for a moment and, and, and contemplate and get our eyes upon the Lord and see what He has done and what He is doing, and this is what the psalmist does. Look at verse 2, if you would. Why am I here? Well, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about the Lord. It's about God. Worshiping. See, we come to worship Him. You see? Uh, you know, we, we fellowship, we edify, we we'll build each other up. But it's not a social club. It's about Him. <coughs> and so, verse 2 says, The works of the Lord are great. Sign out of all them that have pleasure therein. Is that what you did this morning? You sought out these works? You wanted to come to fellowship because you wanted to hear about the works of God. You want to hear about what God is doing. Maybe in your brother or sister's life, or about maybe your life, or you can edify, you know, like we're going to, we're willing to give, give a time of thanksgiving and praise. I, I hope your tongue will be loosened, prepared to give thanks for what God has done, what He is doing, what He's going to do. And so this, this idea of works, notice it says in verse 2 again, the works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. Does that include you this morning? Did you come to seek out God's works this morning? Did you might glorify Him and be blown away, <laughs> amazed? You sit there and be marvel at the Lord Jesus, of His grace, His, His might, His work. You see, God can be known. Your ones, listen, no matter what the world is saying, God can be known. The Spirit of God has revealed Him, not only in creation, but in revelation, through the Word of God. But as we look at that revelation, what has God done? What is God doing? What, what will He do? The, the verse in John chapter 3, verse 21, I'm going to read that. It's, a, it's in the midst of saying those that are in darkness, they don't come to the light, they hate the light, and, and, and uh, lest their deeds are reproved. Remember those verses? But there's another verse there, First John, John 3, 21 says that, But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. What does that mean? You say, I want to come to the light to show off that whatever is good or whatever is gracious in me, it's all of the Lord. It's His work. It's His work. Peter puts it this way. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. He says... To show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Now, it says here in verse 2, the works of, of the Lord are great. We'll talk about that in a second here. 
sought out of all them that uh, have pleasure in them. I, I don't see many atheists seeking God's works this morning, do you? Darwinist, evolutionist, secular scientist, they're not seeking out God's works. They, they don't want anything to do with it. The philosopher, <laughs> psychiatrist, all those, but, but let's not forget the religionists this morning. Are they seeking out God's works this morning? Again, it says, um, um, sought out of all them. That's, that's why I'm here. I'm, I'm here to meet with God and see some of His glorious works to be reminded. See, the religionists, like the, the guy there, the publican, the Pharisee, I think Luke 18, you see, he was absorbed with self, right? He could speak of self-achievement and he could boast in himself. But see, that's not what we're doing this morning. I'm not going to boast in myself or what I've achieved. You see, the psalmist says, The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. Now, these great works, they're great in design, they're great in size, they're great in number, they're great in excellency. Dear ones, if you really think about it, God's works are overwhelming. Overwhelming. In a sense, they're so blinding to look at. They're so glorious. It only can take a little bit. You know, we were, we had the privilege of being in Georgia during the eclipse. And I've seen them before. I've seen one before, so it wasn't really others. I mean, so we had these little glasses and stuff like that, and you're looking up, and you know, and, and just, you just, you know, and, and then the little ones were telling the little ones, don't look up at them. With your bare eyes, you, you could go blind, you could mess up your eyes. You see, God's glory, God, we can only take a little bit, a glimpse of God's glorious works. Just a little bit, because they're so great. They're so great. You see how the psalmist describes his works. For example, in Psalm 89, 5 it says, And the heaven shall praise thy wonders. O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. There's verses that we have talked about in creation. For example, Psalm 19. You know it, right? It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. You see, we don't have to go far if we have eyes to see this morning, right? And it takes the work of the Holy Spirit. Rebirth. You can look out on creation and say, oh, that's natural evolution and, uh, you know, all this other, all this other un, uh, uh, biased scientific uh, geology, archaeology, all this other stuff. I mean, they, they find data, but you see, they, it's perverted data. They bias it. They, they make it to fit their mold. It has to be secular. It has to be fit the evolutional plan. Okay? No, no. As we, by His grace, are saved, we can look out in creation. We, it's, not, it's not like, well, I can look out in creation and deny physics. No, I, I love physics. I love chemistry. Those are, those are arts, science, engineering. But you see, I see a complexity of creation, and I see God at work. That's God, Holy Spirit. Or turn with me to Psalm 139. For a minute. Psalm 139. Look at 14 through 18. You see, we're talking about uh, the little baby in the mother's womb. It says, I, Psalm 139, verse 14, it says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Remember, we're talking about God's works are great. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth quite well. My substance was not hid from thee. When I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, thine eyes did not see, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in the book all my members were written, which is continuous, were fashioned, when as yet they were none of them. And the idea is, is, is the, the forming of, of, the, of, of the baby in the womb. See, he says, all God's working, marvelous working in the womb, this little baby. The psalmist is saying, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, 
They are more in number than the sand. If I wake, I am still with thee. He says, uh, For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and my soul knoweth right well. And so when the psalmist describes God's works as great, you see, but see, that's how it's really in, in our day, even in, among Christians, God's works of creation, God's creation, uh, God's works of, uh, of birth and forming the baby in the womb, they're not so great anymore. We, we can duplicate many things in, in the lab, right? Science test tubes, they're not so great. But God says they're without excuse. Because creation does show God's eternal power and Godhead. He says, therefore, they are without excuse. You see, every part of God's creation cries out, what a great work you have done, God. And it should, it should gender, it should induce, it would, should bring forth praise and thanksgiving. But the lost humanity, it says there in Romans, that uh, they are not thankful. They're not thankful. What a day to be on Thanksgiving Day and not be thankful. Let's go on here for a minute. Verse 3, Psalm 111. Notice it says there the change from work to works. Verse 3 says, His work is honorable and glorious, and His righteousness endures forever. Could you think of one work today that is honorable and glorious? But there's really a lot. You know, Christ's incarnation is a glorious work, isn't it? How could that miracle happen? Christ's resurrection. We, I mean, he could go, he, he's exalted on high. He's, he's, he's in that God, very God, very men. But I think the psalmist is also talking about salvation. <laughs> what a great work God has done in your heart this morning. It's an honorable and glorious work. Maybe we can, let's just compare some of the great works of men. Is there really any comparison? You think of, you know, I, I mean, music, you know, Mozart and Beethoven and all those other guys, you know. Big monuments of people, you know, big works. You know, the seven wonders of the world. Can they compare to what God has done in salvation? Can they compare in, in Christ's resurrection, the virgin birth, His exaltation, His coming again? All of it. You see, God's works are great, and they're honorable and glorious. Notice in verse 3, again, it says, uh, they're done in, in righteousness. It's because it's the Lord, our righteousness, who has done it all. We could never do it. And it says there in verse 3, it endureth forever. Aren't you thankful this morning that your salvation endureth forever? And it's not based upon how good you are, or what you can do, or what you will do, but it's based upon the perfect righteousness of Christ, imputed to you, given to you, and garments. You are as, as, as secure as Christ is in heaven this morning, as a believer. And we ought to say, wow, you know, I don't know how about you, but, you know, I, I well, actually, I, I used to, when I was in Pentecostalism, and not just Armenian Pentecostalism, you know, I, you can lose your salvation. You can lose your salvation. If you, the idea is this, if you ever stop fighting, if you ever stop overcoming, if you ever stop uh, yielding the sword against sin and the flesh and the devil in the world. If you ever stop, then you could lose your salvation, and then, I don't know if you could start over. That great work could be all lost. No, no. No. It doesn't. The, the, it says, his work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endureth forever. Look at verse 4 as we go on looking at God's works for a minute. It says, He hath made His wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. The word wonderful has the idea of distinguished. Wonderful, 
one of a kind. See, God's works are so wonderful, they cannot be copied, they cannot be counterfeited. And, and look there uh, in verse 4, where the psalmist throws in, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. How wonderful is His grace this morning. It should, you know, think of the, His work of grace and His work of compassion. In the saving of sinners. I mean, Brother John said too. Not only saving sinners, but keeping us, right? How we fall, how we, we, we derivate, we turn. You know, we need to be saved this morning. As a, you know, we are saved, we're being saved. He keeps us. We don't fall away. He doesn't let us loose. He doesn't leave us alone. Why? Because God's works are wonderful. In, in the Lord Jesus, Isaiah says this, For unto us a child is born, unto a, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Wonderful. How wonderful is God work, God's works are today to you? How wonderful. Maybe you need to be reminded, and we're going to be reminded through the Lord's table. How's that? But you see, in those verses in verse 4, he hath made his wonderful works to be remembered. And we'll see that in a minute. You see, the demoniac, when he got saved there in Mark chapter 5, when he asked the Lord if he could go with the Lord, the Lord said, no, you go back home and you tell your folks, your family, how great and marvelous and wonderful how God has showed you compassion. And dear ones, you know what it says? Mark 5, 20 says this, And he departed, and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. Boy, could you, could you imagine telling someone at work, at school, trying to minister to someone, and you, you talk about the marvelous, wonderful works of God in salvation, His grace, His mercy, His goodness. And you say, you know, you only talk about the Lord Jesus. Well, he's the only one that's wonderful. The man went home and said, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you how he saved me. In John 7, 21, the Lord does a miracle. And this is, this is like, I don't know, you say, the Lord has a sense of humor. In John 7, 21, Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and ye all marvel. You know, I, 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 I spoke the world in existence and you don't marvel. I formed a little baby in your womb and you don't marvel. I sustain you, I keep you, as the Lord Jesus does, right? Colossians chapter 1. Everything is sustained by him, by the word of his power. And he says, I've done this little miracle and you marvel. So let's look at this aspect of God reminding us this morning, okay? Verse 4, he says, He hath made us wonderful. He hath made His wonderful works to be remembered. You see, first of all, the psalmist starts with God's character. He wants us to remember the Lord is gracious. The Lord is full of compassion. You see, that's what we find when we seek His face, when we seek him with our whole heart. He will always be gracious and full of compassion. But see, here our Lord wants us to be reminded. It's just like remembrance or, uh, you know, you know, reminiscing. You ever get, catch yourself reminiscing? Or Rehearsing the great works of God. The idea is the call to remember. Now, it's, it's really a, a blessing, dear ones, listen, this morning, that we have the Word of God before us. That we have the accounts of God's awesome works, and what He's done, and what He's doing, and what He will do. Could you imagine one day without the Bible? 
You know, okay? You can't go back to read the creation account. You can't go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and look at the Calvary's cross because it's not there. You don't have it there to remind you. You can't go to the book of Revelation and see all the glory there and the coming of Christ and the judgment and the angels proclaiming the omnipotent God reigneth. Lord, we have a blessing, dear ones, this morning when we have the Bible. It's all there written there and for us to remember through call. And then, dear ones, we have the Lord's table. See, it does say, do this in remembrance of me. God's works remembered, first of all, in creation. Look at verse 5. He hath given meat unto them that fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. This, this speaks of, I, I think, uh, maybe in a way, Noah's day, okay, but also in Israel's day. Now the psalmist is, is going to now remember some things, okay. He's going to remember creation, he's going to remember redemption, things of that sort. But you see, in Noah's day it says, and God remembered Noah. <laughs> God remembered Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in Israel. And this morning, dear ones, he's going to remember the new covenant that he's made with us. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. When we do come to remember him, and that as we take, partake of the bread and, and, the, and the cup, we're doing this in remembrance of, you see, that's that covenant through his blood. The forgiveness of sins, new life in Christ, reconciliates all that He's given to us. He remembers His people. He remembers His covenant. He rose up to deliver His people, it says there. Can't imagine not God remembering His covenant today. Could you think of that for a minute? God forgetting not to remember His covenant his word, his promises. But it goes on here, in verse 6, uh, God's works remembered in Israel's deliverance from Egypt. He has shown his people the power of his works, that he may give them the heritage of the heathen. You see, it speaks of the power of his works. You know, there, back then there was ten plagues. There was the death of the firstborn. He threw, overthrew and, 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 and destroyed Pharaoh. You know? They found Pharaoh face down in, in, the, in the river, right? The greatest power, the world power I've ever seen up to that day. God destroyed Pharaoh. The psalmist says, look. He says, he hath showed his people the power of his works. Of course, the, the crossing of the Red Sea was no small thing either, right? Oh, ar ar archaeology and, and uh, geology. All that. No, no, it was, it was a little part of this. It was a marsh. And, no, it was really, he didn't cross the Red Sea. It was... <coughs> you see, humanistic reasoning wants to, to strip God of his power, of his mighty works, his glory. The psalmist says, no, no. The power of his works, the ten plagues, the death of the firstborn, the destruction of Pharaoh, crossing of the Red Sea. It, it says there, um, He has showed His people the power of His works, that he, that he may give them the heritage of His heathen. He gave them the meat. He gave them the manna. He gave them the water from the rock. He gave them the quail. He gave them shade by day and a pillar of fire by night. He brought them all the way into the promised land, just like He promised. And the psalmist says, He has showed His people the power of His works. Verse 5, He hath given meat unto them that fear Him. Talks about those verses where their clothes never wore out. Their shoes never wore out. God provided a table throughout the wilderness. And all he basically wanted them to do was to praise him, right? To thank him, to love him, to obey him, to follow him. And all Israel did, <laughs> right? Murmur, complain. 
You see, dear ones, he wants us to remember God's uh, works remembered, but also they're in redemption. Look at verses 7, 8, and 9 quickly as we go on. 7, 8, and 9, I think, are kind of connected. Let me read it to you. The works of his hands are verity and judgment, and his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever, and are done in truth and righteous uprightness. He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverent is his name. So I believe like 7 and 8 and 9 kind of build up to this aspect of redemption. When we think about redemption, it says an injustice and judgment. Verity is the idea of, of truthfulness or trustworthiness, assured. You see, and, and so as we look at redemption, we realize that it's not at the expense of justice or judgment. Yes, he is full of grace and full of compassion, like verse 4 says. But also Paul says that grace is going to reign through righteousness. Righteousness. Verse 8 tells us, They stand fast forever and ever, speaking of his works, and are done in truth and uprightness. See, they're according to God's excuse me, unchangeable eternal will and purpose. We've been studying that in the book of Ephesians. We were saved on purpose for a purpose. God sent His Word. God sent redemption. He commanded His covenant on purpose for a purpose. You were not saved by accident. But you see, in this redemption work, you see justice and judgment are upheld. Let's look at that for a minute. It says that uh, um, there in uh, verse 8, they stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and, up, and uprightness. Let me give you a couple of verses. Isaiah 42, 21. Isaiah 42, 21 says this. The Lord is well pleased for His righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. Matthew 5, 17 says this. Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now when you, when you read the gospel according to the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, you don't come to the word love until five chapters into the book. And you say, well, you know, isn't, isn't redemption all about love? Yes, amen. It's all about God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But you see, the gospel is this, that God might be just and the justifier of them that believeth in Jesus. You see, our redemption is according to righteousness, holiness, His character, godliness, in that truth and uprightness. Unchangeable. Psalm 85.10 says this, Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. You know, I don't know, maybe that's what we need to think about this morning. How could God be just and the justify of them that believe in Jesus? How could God's holy nature and His holy righteousness and holiness come into contact with, with vile sinners as we are? And not, you know, His wrath come upon us. We deserve to be destroyed. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a mind-boggling work. How can God reconcile us and still be holy? How could God forgive us and not violate His justice and His righteousness? Well, the truth is this. The soul that sinned in my, it shall surely die. And the Lord Jesus, as our substitute, took our place. He took our stroke. He paid the penalty. Sam? Get over there where you to be. I mean, maybe we're so familiar with that work that we lose sight. I mean, it was a, you know, like the angels had to look back and, you know, how's God going to work this out? We know the whole story now, right? And maybe because we, hope we know the whole story, we're so familiar with the gospel, we realize that, that it's an infinite work. It's a, a you know, omnipotent work. <laughs> Where justice and righteousness can kiss, it says there, it says, mercy and truth are met together. <clears throat> righteousness and peace have kissed each other. How can God forgive a sinner and still be just? He can be through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> By trusting Him, your sins put upon Him, and His righteousness <coughs> given to you. 
that's how God. That's one of the greatest works. And, and dear ones, what the psalmist is saying, he says, these are the great works of God in redemption. In redemption. You see, a ransom has been found that will satisfy, fulfill, uphold God's honor, glory, and law. And dear ones, listen, this is, you know, maybe, so I, I'm, not, I'm not really, that doesn't seem very important this morning in the gospel message in our world. It doesn't. More people talk about, you know, God loves you, God cares about you, God, you know, God's, all that's true, but you see, the gospel, according to the Apostle Paul, is that God is just and justified then to believe in Jesus. When we start realizing that uh, what it took for God to forgive us of our sins and still be just, it will blow us away. It will cause such praise and adoration and thanksgiving, because he did the impossible. He did the impossible, what we could not do or ever do could never come into our minds, the salvation through Christ. In Luke 19, verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, it says, This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then he says, Of whom I am chief. Notice what it says there in verse 9. He sent redemption unto his people. No, no, you weren't seeking it. <laughs> you weren't looking for it. He sent it. He commanded it, it says there. That's great. He had commanded his covenant forever. He said, you know, go and, and find that one last sheep on purpose, for a purpose. The Word of God, the Holy Spirit, quickens. That's a great work. Your ones. A great work. Especially, where were you? Well, or what were you doing? When God found you. Were you running towards Him or running away from Him? Well, the scriptures tell us this, and let me, and I'll be done. It says, uh, I was sought of them that asked not of me. I had found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me, unto a nation that was not called by my name. You weren't seeking him. He sought you. He sent his word. What a great work. He commanded his covenant to save you according to grace and mercy. You see, God's works remembered. Almost done now. Look at Revelation chapter 5 for a minute. The psalm says, I will praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright. And then he, he says, well, what will cause me to praise him and magnify him and worship him is that I remember his works. I remember his great works. I remember all that he's done. And as I remember these things, okay, what God has done and His grace and His mercy, He will cause me to praise Him. Now, Revelation 4 is about all of the universe. In heaven, they're worshiping and praising God for creation. Okay? In chapter 5, the redeemed of the Lord is praising the Lord Jesus, the Lamb that was slain for redemption. Let's, let's look at that for a second. Look at verse. 8 and 9. Chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. And when he had taken the book, and speak of the Lord Jesus, and remember John is looking for some, there's a book and nobody can unlock the seals. You see, no one has the birthright, no one has the, the authority, but the, but the line, uh, the Judah, the Lord Jesus, the root of David there in verse 5. And when he had taken the book, and the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vows full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Look at verse 11, jump there for a minute. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne.
throne and the beasts and the elders and the numbers of them were ten thousand thousands and thousands and thousands of thousands. What were they saying? Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven, verse 13, and on the earth, and under the earth, and such are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Dear ones, what are they doing? They're remembering God's works, the Lord Jesus' works in redemption. And as they magnify Him, they realize what a great work the Lord has done. It's the song of the redeemed. Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord, the psalmist says. So let's close with this. Why should I praise Him? Hmm? Why should I praise Him? Just consider His works for a moment. The idea is, behold, consider his works of creation, consider his works of providence. God is the sovereign God, working mightily in our midst. You're here because he helped you to be here, he directed, he guided you to be here. The works of creation, the works of providence, the works of redemption. He says, you shall be willing in the day of his power. You see, I want to be here with God's people. I want to worship Him because He has redeemed me. And it talks about how praise is comely of a saint. Redemption, we think of His works of judgment. We could think of Christ's second coming. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, it says, With flaming fire taking vengeance upon those that know not God. That obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ with flame and fire. We can think of his works that one day there were, could be soon, how soon I don't know, the recreation of a new heavens and a new earth. I mean, consider his works. When the day sin will be gone, and death will be gone, and Satan will be gone, and every tear will be gone. What a great work that will be, brother. Dear ones, how about that great work this morning that we can go to dying, Christ-rejecting world and say to, to our loved ones, to our family members, to our friends, to our enemies, you know what? Jesus lives. Jesus lives today, dear brother. He lives. Whether you believe it or not, <laughs> He lives. What a great work to go forth in this world and... Uh, not just controversial, Brother Joseph, but, you know, sometimes they look at you, 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 act, you actually believe he rose from dead, you actually believe he's alive? Yes, he's alive. What a great work. We could, you could just stop there, and, and, and we could have a lot to worship and praise him for, if we consider his works. Especially of salvation and redemption, that he redeemed us by his blood by his love. But we can also take a moment to, to behold his character. Look at verse 9 for a minute. He says, Holy and reverent is his name. Holy and reverent is his name. You see, his name is, he says he has exalted his word above his name. So we can think about what he thinks about his word. You see, he, he's placed his name upon the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other name. There's no other name. It's at the name of Jesus. Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, the host of heaven, there in Revelation 5 and 4 and 5, they're saying, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is that name. Holy and reverent is that name. And what do we do? And what are we allowed to do, brother? Look at Hebrews 13 for a minute. Verse 15 and 16. And see if this will help you. Hebrews 13, 15 through 16. It says, By him, therefore, let us offer 
the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name, but to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. You see, we are, we are to come into His presence and we are to offer Him praises and thanksgiving, spiritual sacrifices through Him, which are acceptable in His name. It says, that having therefore a kingdom that cannot be shaken, it said, let us serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Reverent and holy is His name. Verse 10 tells us to fear the Lord, fear His name, be in awe, tremble in His presence, rejoice evermore, and always, always give thanks. Wow. Verse 10 tells us, it says, A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. See, the verse there says, you know what? You ever, you ever run into somebody that's praising the Lord all the time? Praise the Lord. I mean, every other word, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I mean, when I was in charismatic faith call. And I'm not saying all of it's uh, counterfeit or just putting a show on. But you, you know what I mean. There's some, some Christians that, that every other word is praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You know? And I don't mind that to some degree. Okay? But when I start looking at their life and their fruit and their obedience to the Word of God, I'm sitting there, wow, this is, this is just a show. This is just lip service. Anybody can say, praise the Lord. But see, the verse says there, a good understanding have all they that do His commandments, you see. You see, the fear of the Lord, you see, I'm to obey Him, I'm to surrender to Him, I'm to submit to Him, I'm to follow Him, I'm to worship the Lamb. And a good understanding is that I, I, I know what the Lord's will is, and I'm going to practice what I preach. I'm going to, if I'm going to praise the Lord, I'm going to realize that all uh, heaven is looking and, and it's before the Lord, and, and, and I want to be, I want it to be done in truth and, and sincerity. I, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to play church. I don't want to just give Him lip service. I want to praise Him with my lips, and I want to praise Him with my life. But where do we start this morning? Well, we start with praise. Is that what it? Praise ye the Lord, verse 1. And where do you end? Verse 10. Pray, his praise endures forever. What does that mean? You see, the object of our praise, see, God is eternal. His gloriousness and holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. That's Moses' song, Exodus 15, verse 11. I read the song about that. It says, uh, it says uh, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You see, his praise endures forever. And finally, it says, Our endless praise. Our endless praise. What will you be doing for eternity? <clears throat> Which you're doing this morning, praising and joyful in your heart, lifting up your voices in praise and thanksgiving, singing songs unto the Lord, making melody in your heart. That's being filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter five. Do you have a song this morning? He, he dropped me out of the horrible pit, right? He put me upon the rock and he gave me this glorious song. Do you want to sing, praise Him, magnify Him? <clears throat> You say, well, I don't feel like it this morning. Well, start thinking of remembering His works. Start remembering His works. You know, and notice what it says there. This is an amazing thing here. It says there in verse 4. Look there with me and I'll be done. He hath made His wonderful works to be remembered. <laughs> He's not going to allow you to forget. He's going to remind us. <coughs> If you want to listen, this morning, right before us, is a reminder. A glorious reminder. I hope it stirs you up. 
It says, with your whole heart, to praise Him, to magnify Him, to thank Him. And dear ones, listen, and I know most of you here, you see, you praise Him when uh, it's going bad, you praise Him when it's not too good, you praise Him outside of the four walls of this building, you, you thank Him, you pray, you lift up your voice, but I'm just saying, do it more! Do it more as you see the day approaching. As you see the, the turmoil, as you see the world going mad, they need to see the praise, the thanksgiving, the exaltation, a worshiper of God. That's what they need to see. And that's what God has called us to do. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endures forever. What did the Lord Jesus say? When he, the triumph entry, he came into Jerusalem. What did they sing? Hosanna! <laughs> right? Hosanna to the king! Threw down their palm leaves and all that. And, and, uh, and King David, you know, the, the son of David is coming. Hosanna! Hosanna! And what did the Pharisees say? Tell them, tell them to be quiet. Tell them to be quiet. Tell them to shut up. And what did the Lord Jesus say? Is it even the rock? Is it right? The rocks will cry out. The rocks will cry out. Sing Hosanna. How much more do we have that privilege this morning? To sing Hosanna and praise. As we think about His works. That's, that, that's what we need, brother. Not what I'm doing, not my woes, not my misery, not my failings, not, you know, His marvelous, glorious works. And praise Him for it. Thank Him for it. Let's praise. Father, we thank You for this time. And uh, we thank You for Your works. For who You are. Creation, redemption, everything that's mentioned there. And uh, we do want to praise You. And uh, forgive us where we murmur, complain. Either we forget or we're ignorant. We're silent when we should be praising you. We're not obeying the scriptures. It says in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Rejoice evermore. And I know it's hard. It's impossible. But with the Holy Spirit in us. And as we think about those things that are lovely, holy, pure, and right, Good report, just. It says the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds to pass in Christ. So, Lord, we ask for that peace. And we ask that you might loosen our tongues, that we might praise you, that we might magnify you. Not just here in church, but in every aspect of our lives. Fill us with thy spirit. Bring glory and honor to your name. We ask these things in Jesus' name.